I'm a photographer from Minneapolis, and uh, I first heard about Lil Peep when I got a random phone call from Chase, who is his manager, and I didn't know who this person was, Chase or Peep, and this was in 2016, and uh, he called and said, I just answered randomly, it was like, um, this guy was like, hey, I work with this dude named Lil Peep, he likes your photos, I know about your photos, we all like them, you should come live with him on Skid Row, he's crazy and does all this cool stuff, and like, yeah, da, 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 da. and like, I'm probably exaggerating it, but that's what it sounded like in my head, and um, but it was very like, you should come live with Lil Peep on Skid Row, and film him, and film his life, and, because he's going to be huge, and I was like, nah, I'm good, man, that's, who are, what, who, what, who's, who, no, I'm not, no, no, Lil Peep. I don't know what that is. I don't know who he is. Sorry, man. Like, I have to go back to working at the grocery store. Like, see ya. <laughs> and uh, I kick myself every like day about just not taking that chance, you know. But you know, when I'm I'm older, and I couldn't just like up and leave on like a gamble about some guy who's, you know, I don't, you know, I don't know, you know. And the way that you described it didn't sound like the, the it just sounded like a wild adventure that I wasn't ready to. A couple months go by, and um, Nature World Night Out happens in February, and he, uh, Chase, uh, and the people in Nature World, uh, f like, flew me out to shoot it, because I shot the first Nature World, and they were like, my stuff, and Peep and GBC were on. I was backstage, and suddenly Lil Peep walked in, and the whole energy of the room just kind of changed. And you could tell that people were focusing on him. It felt different, and it felt like you're like in the presence of something, a person that was like had a big, like just a big personality and a vibe. And like at, at that moment, like I was even like starstruck, and I didn't even really know who he was. It was just like the energy, him, his, the people he was with, and this vibe and this new thing. And it was even before he played. And then he played, and I got it instantly. I was like, oh my God, it was special. It was something different. It was just so, it was good, but it almost sometimes wasn't good, but that was even the best part about it. It was just so raw and real and different. And the energy was there and the fans were just, it was in LA and the fans were just hanging on every word and every song. And then after Chase came up and introduced himself to me and he introduced me to Peep and Peep was like, he knew my photos and I said, hey man, I'm, I'm Adam, I do like punk photos and I also do hip hop and I kind of combined them to do this like kind of different little style. He was like, oh yeah, just like me. I was like, yeah dude, cool. Exactly, that's like, to a T what he said, exactly. And then he posed for a lot of photos with me and, um, and that was that. It was getting past like a mental barrier of like, what is Lil Peep, you know? Even when you first hear the name and then you see him and it's like, what is going like I'm not like a shy person about like people or I think people are weird or this but it's like and then you hear the music and you like if you're not really listening to it it's like you had to break through that little barrier of like like judgment he like he changed my he changed he changed my world you know it was just right now I'm on tour with Post Malone and because of Lil Peep I'm on tour with Post Malone like f flat out create like flat Post Malone's manager is a fan of Lil Peep. He became a fan of my photos through Lil Peep. And Post got a Lil Peep tattoo that was my photo. And then when I met him, we just started talking about Lil Peep. That was, our, that was what we talked about. And then he started to like my photos. And then we kept on going in contact, staying in contact, and now I'm on tour with him. All the photos you see from, like, from day and night and all the other stuff, there was no studio, no nothing. It was just us, like in the street. Like we walked around the streets of Minnesota just doing photos. Or we'd walk around LA, or we'd do festival stuff, or we'd do this. And just being around them was just so, so like, it was, it was good. It felt like, like a f you met your friends, you know? Like you came like, oh, these are your, your people, you know? This is, it was crazy because I thought like the punk scene was like my people. And then I was like, no, it's not. It's the fucking SoundCloud rap scene is my fucking people. That's crazy. You know? It was just like he had this such a positive energy where it was just like open, an open energy to think and people and like let everybody into his world, you know? So I would always text him, right? 
I text him photos, and uh, the last photo I ever sent him was the one that everybody knows. That was the last photo, and that's the one that everybody knows now. Cause I didn't know it was a, uh, I didn't know what I had, cause I had to like dive deep into the photos to actually see that this photo is there. You know, yeah, I would just, just you know, text him, and that became the photo that everybody knows. The last time I ever texted him was that. When he passed, I started like I got to know everybody, you know, like his mom and people and stuff like cause through the photos, you know. Somehow my photos became the 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 ones that were used, and I mean like I'm I'm eternally grateful for that, you know, like that they um, want to memorialize memorialize him with one of my images, which is very humbling and very nice. And when it's happening, when you're in the actual moment of it, you don't care, you know. Then looking back on you, like, wow, that's that's a big thing, you know. Like, yeah, just he changed my life. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, little peep changed my life, and now I'm here, and this is my job. I quit fucking Whole Foods to <laughs> come on tour and live my dream. Um, my name is Alfred Womack, and um, I'm Gus's uncle. And I probably really remember him most when he's like starting to kind of run around and talk. And he had a really, just a sweet little voice. I don't know quite how to describe it, but just sort of light and playful and kind of curious about whoever he was talking to and open and sort of, you, even as a little kid, you know, you felt like he was really paying attention. Well, I remember Eliza saying, well, he's thinking about going to school for it. Um, and I remember saying, <laughs> tell him not to do that and to go try and get like an internship in a studio because that's the way to get into that side of the industry if that's what he wants to do. I don't think I understood that what he wanted was to be a star, um, and it seems like that is pretty clearly what he wanted. Um, maybe not, I don't know. At a certain point, my coworkers at the bike shop started to, because I would always be like, oh, my nephew is making music, like, check out the SoundCloud or whatever, you know? Like, because some of them are, like, also, like, in one way or another involved in music industry stuff. And um, so I wanted to, like, promote him in whatever way I could, I guess. And um, But, yeah, I, there was a certain point where I was like, check it out, see? I told you so. <laughs> like, he was really doing it, you know? And, um, yeah, it was cool. I felt like... In some way, like, oh, this little bike shop in Brooklyn were all, like, rooting for him, you know? It was cool. It was really awesome. Um, he really, like, had the crowd with him in an amazing way that not everybody can do. Um, and maybe a lot of it is because it was kind of like a hometown show, you know? A lot of his friends came from Long Beach. He was like, you know, he's like, oh, see that guitar? That's the guitar from, like, Time of Your Life. And, like, you know, he had all his kind of, like, old man souvenirs, you know? And then it was, like, apparently about three hours of listening to beats that Rob Cavallo and Lil John had made in, like, 2005. And Rob Cavallo being, like, you know, if you think you could use any of this, like, totally, like, man, that would be awesome. And, like, Gus is sitting there kind of, like, okay. You know, like, I mean, imagine Lil John, like, circa 2005 and, you know... At the time, I thought, like, well, he's probably fine, and if he stopped posting things, then maybe I would be worried, but if he's, like, you know, he's got his phone, the phone has a charge, he's, like, on the phone, on the app, like, typing, you know, like, you have to be pretty with it to do all that stuff, so I guess, um, if, I don't know if I thought it was a cry for help as much as a way of making a connection with his f Well, when he said all those political things, because he said, I remember, you know, I followed him on Instagram, um, and I remember seeing one post or another about, mm, you know, like LGBT rights or Israel or that kind of thing, and he, I remember being really proud of him, I guess, for standing his ground on that stuff. I thought, especially coming from someone who did have so much, such a wide audience, um, it was really important and brave. I thought he was very brave 
um, as a person and as an artist. I think that having the Instagram and social media presence that he did is a way of, well, people are going to listen, you know. My name is Angelo Lozano. Um, me and Gus were actually, I'd like to consider him my, if not my best childhood friend, definitely top three. He was very, very, very into music, you know, like he had already been starting to dye his hair and stuff like that. You already saw that, it's him trying to copy Eminem and stuff. Sometimes he would start like freestyling in front of us, a bunch of us. He's starting to like freestyle, blah, blah, blah. And we're all like, Oh, nah, you're, you're writing all this down. You write this down every single night. Like, I know we know you do, because he was getting, like, he was, he was doing pretty good. It was funny. And I just remember that this exact uh, bus ride, that we finally call him out. We're like, yo, that's it. No no free step, no phone. Here, give us your phone freestyle. We don't believe you. Go ahead, do something. We just put on a beat, and, like, he just killed it right away. Started rapping. It was awesome. He was, uh... That's when I finally believed it. I was like, holy shit, maybe he's like, he's good. He was always popular. He was always, girl star, he was like one of the most attractive kids in the grade. Because the way the kids here in Long Beach like act, they feel like they need to live up to this standard that everyone lives up to. Like you need to do that to be cool and like just like always be social or whatever. And Gus like just didn't want to do that and just wanted to chill at home. So like that like developed him the anxiety. So like he actually got anxious, I feel like, because people expected too much from him because I was saying like he's popular, attractive, like people wanted to, wanted to see him out all the time. So, I mean, he always cared about like, he always cared about people. There was this, our, this one friend, Quinn. Do you know our friend Quinn? A lot of people misunderstood him, but Gus always hung out with Quinn, always, all the time, no matter what. Like, he wouldn't go out to parties and just hang out with Quinn. And Quinn's a man, like, I love Quinn. But, like, he was always misunderstood and didn't hang around with, like, a bunch of other people that were expected to. And Gus just always stuck around. Gus took me in, whatever. And he would always just be sitting in his room. I guess it just helped him make music, make, like, express, his, express the way he feels. Um, I liked it. It was, it was different. It was cool. I didn't hate on it. Lil Peep was dope. I thought he was like, going to change it eventually, but he never did. Stay Lil Peep. Yeah, like, you know, I thought like Lil Peep was like a, like a little unprofessional name. So like, I thought he was going to like make it a different. You know how people do that sometimes. Some artists, right? Right. So artists do that. I was like, he would post something on SoundCloud and I would share it on Twitter. Every single track he had. Once the heavier parts came out, I don't. I was like, "This isn't Gus. This is, this is a front. It's not. A, it's not like a bad front. It's like, a, it's like he's like he's just trying to be a good guy and like make sure. Well, that he wanted to make people feel good. Like I was joking around. I was like, "Your music kind of sucks, dude. Your music's like, it's just like not popping. I'm just like, it just like you got, you can't get that out because like the fans will fucking kill me, you know. Like fans will f be like, oh damn, now it's a front. But like, he didn't want people to think that. He wants to help people out. That's just why I think that he was a happy ass dude. Like, he was just trying to do his best to like make it a better world, like make people more happy. Yeah, yeah dude. There was, there was, there was, nice. there was, yeah, there was points in like where like he was um doing like part one and stuff like that or where he didn't even have enough money to be doing all that kind of shit you know what i'm saying like that that's what i'm saying like he'd be like coke there's coke on my shelf like hey like, bro there was never coke on your shelf like you know what i'm saying a lot of that was a persona image like i'm this kind of dude like this is me my boy sam who you're about to interview um, he texts me, he goes, yo, like, have you heard anything about Gus? I was like, no, why? He goes, because, uh, yeah, dude, I think he might have, I think he just died. He goes, he, I think he just overdosed. And I was like, and I don't know, I just instantly believed it. Like, I just instantly, it was just like, oh, fuck. And then I was, I just sat there for a little bit. And then, then it hit me, like, after, like, five minutes, maybe. 
Like, I, after sitting there, for, I, I, I tried to sit there as long as possible, like, acting, like, cool. Like, I was, like, being, like, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm chilling, like, good. And then, then 10 minutes later, I, like, go into my room. And then I, like, break down for, like, a little bit. I have a feeling he might have left me off, like, well, like, if he actually made it, he would have, like, gotten, like, in touch with me or some shit. Because, like, he, like, we understood how that we had different lives and, like, how we each had to live our own life. And he felt bad for, like, a bunch of, like, friends like me, for example. Like, you know, people with lower income and stuff like that. I knew that after come over part, uh, when you're sober part one came out, I knew it's like, wow, well, it's over. Like, yeah, it was just mad soon afterwards. It was, way, it was just way soon after the fact that. If I had, if I had to like exp explain the kid, like he was not a junkie. Like he was the, the greatest person ever. He cared about every like a lot of people like that he meant it that like meant good you know. He was so fucking intelligent like. I don't know people get this wrong impression like. Like older people for example like. I don't know, people won't understand the reason why this documentary is being made. Like, kid had, kid had good intentions. Like, the best intentions in the world. He was gonna be, he was gonna, he was gonna make it, you know? That's all I really have to say. Yeah, there's a purity in the I heard the song Beamer Boy, and I was like, this is when Beamer Boy was like, super low key, like didn't have that many plays or whatever, and that shit changed my life. For real, like, that shit changed my life, and I had to send him. I wanted just to make music with him. Like, he had no type of, like, big following or anything. I just really fucked with him, like, for real. And then um, I hit Cold Heart up, and I was like, yo, pretty much I fuck with Peep. Like, let me get his email so I can send him beats. So then I, uh, I sent a lot of beats to Peep, and then he actually ended up using two of them on, like, his one of his first bigger projects called Cry Baby. But yeah, I know I, up until then, I didn't meet him in person or anything. It was all like through the internet. Pete first came into the picture around late 2015, early 2016. Our collabs were kind of rare, like, but we just started hanging out more. And then he just hit me up like while he was working on Cry Baby. And I already made a song with Charlie Shuffler, the producer of Big City Blues called Never. And I guess he really liked that one. And so he started working with Charlie. And then he sent me the ultimate country cowboy song and it was big city blues he made the song already with the charlie shuffler beat and then he was like yo i want you to check this shit out this country song and i was like bet i love country shit i'm about to gas it and then i heard it and like instantly like that night i had to go record on it and then i did and like i had to make it perfect for him and then so i emailed it back to him for recording we mostly sent it back and forth the only song we ever did in person was uh black jeep featuring magnet but yeah, it was usually online. Like literally as simple as email him, emailing him the MP3 file. And that was that. We have not made one song in the same room. One, like ever. Uh, and we have a lot of songs out. But that's what made like the collabs more special, not being in person with each other. We would send it to each other, but make it with each other in mind so that, because we knew like we would do something crazy on it if we made it specially for ourselves. Cause like, I don't know, my relationship with like Peep was like a super creative one and we would just bounce back on each other. So when we sent each other songs, it was rare because we made it like, and we didn't always have like a lot of time. So we had like to craft it for ourselves. And then usually we would send it back to each other and be like, yo, this is hard as fuck. Like first try. Like I never really had to be like, it's kind of whack, redo it. He never once, because a lot of people, if I work with them on the internet, they'll email, they'll DM me back or text me back and be like, yo, can you change this up? or can you add this at this part at this time or whatever. It was never like that. It was literally like, I sent them the beat and he rapped or sang over it however that was. And it's just like crazy to have that connection with someone like so natural and not even like work with them face to face. Like it's crazy. I always just felt super comfortable when I collabed with Pete. I, he just sounded like someone I could collab with all day type. With Peep, I never had to worry about making sure I, get, I got credited with my songs. And 
also, even um, before he passed, I'm not sure if this was him or his label, but, like, either way, like, his label was reaching out to me. I'm not sure what other producers they're reaching out to. And, like, because they're planning on, I'm not sure if they still are, but they're planning on putting the songs on Spotify and Apple Music, all that. And they're reaching out to at least me to make making sure I, I was getting compensated correctly. So, like, I think that, that because legally, how I sent him the beats, I don't think they had to do that, technically. So, like, I think that shows, I don't, I, and I don't think Peep would ever be, like, if I ever was, like, yo, like, if he ever put one of our songs on Spotify, I was, like, yo, like, I didn't get any agreements or I didn't get any contracts, I know for a 100% fact he would make sure I was getting paid correctly, 100%, because, like, whenever I, whenever I was with him in real life, he always made sure I was good, like, with everything, because he was always super thankful I was working with him. And I was super thankful he was working with me. Like, it was super mutual, you know what I mean? So, I don't know, like, it's crazy that, that we're able to, like, make that type of music and have that impact and never, like, do it in the same room. Looking back at it now and, like, reflecting on, like, like the, t the type of turn my career made, like, after those two projects, like, I got, it tatted, I got him tatted on me because of it. Because being, being able to reflect, I was like, wow, like, these projects really changed my life. I'm just happy that I got to know him like actually know him, like speak to him, and just like create things with him. Cause not a lot of people really did. And like he was private about just who he worked with. So now I'm just happy that I got to know Gus. Um, I'm Clams Casino, um, producer from New Jersey. Um, and I worked with Gus uh, just on one song it's called Four Gold Chains. Um, we had plans to work uh, more. That's the only one we ended up getting done, though. Yeah, the, my first reaction was like, yeah, I didn't know what to think about it. I knew for sure was new and like intrigued by that. But yeah, the first, and because the first thing, I, that was right about the time, I guess, I think it was like Hellboy had come out. So that was the first thing I looked up and like, that's a pretty, like, some of those songs, pretty, like, intense, like, introduction to, you know? So, I, yeah, I didn't know what to think at first. And then I was like, yeah, I don't know if I have anything that would work, you know? Just, like, what, what I do, I don't know if it would. And then I, I started kind of backtracking and looking at his music that came out before that that I didn't know about, that I wasn't aware of, and the older mixtapes and stuff. And then I started to understand it, like, just what he, what he, he hears like his like sense of melodies and stuff and kind of how they just like seem to like get stuck in my head and I always like you know that is something that I, I really like notice about his music as well like how he fits himself on the beat like melodically and stuff and, and a lot of like the well some of his earlier mixtapes and stuff like real ambient type uh through a lot more of his music. I'm like, oh wait, yeah, I, th I think what I do actually would work with him really well once I, you know, hear more of the stuff that he's used production-wise and what he does melodically. Like, I was like, I, I got it. Like, yeah, it'll definitely work. That was kind of, in general, rap, rock type situations have never really been done well or right, in my opinion, but until then, and he made it his own thing, like fully. But you can, you can clearly tell all of his influences, with you know, down to what hip hop artists that he, he liked, and and you can you can I think clearly hear all that stuff, and but was able to make it fully his own thing. That might have been the one that we did was like the first beat that I sent him, just that by itself. I, uh, Chase gave me his number and I texted him, asked him for his email and, and I had that one idea of sitting around for a while actually that I had done some other stuff with and people I had messed around with but um, on that beat but nothing ever like finished and that was, that was the one idea that I had for him that I was like this is the first one I'm going to send and he, and he did that one, sent it right back. I was like just what it needed to be, like perfect matchup. Like, you know, I was happy that he, I mean, it was a perfect fit. That's why 
that's why I sent him that one beat. I was like, I hope if he's gonna do anything, this is the one thing I have at the moment that he, you know, he'd be perfect on. And yeah, oh yeah, it's way different now. Yeah, what he's saying and topically, like, yeah, it's. I mean, it's for a lot of the rest of his music. Of course, it's same same situation. To listen to it now is a different feeling, of course. In his music and just like him in general, I didn't know him, I actually never met in person, but you can just tell that, I mean, that kind of attitude comes out in the music that he makes and it's like just seem, you know, effortless like that. He's not trying to do anything really that he not that he's not and just kind of being able to tell or maybe maybe for his fans feel like they know him without ever meeting him or, you know, um, I think that's how he's really been able to connect with so many of them just would like hit me up and be like, yo, I want you to paint a dope ass mural in my backyard. And I, and I was like, okay. And then I came over and Liza was like, yeah, like Dana, we want you to paint a mural. And they would want me to paint like a bunch of things like in their house. In high school, he was like making music. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he always, yeah, like, he always wanted around. to be a rapper. He always fucked around. Like he yeah. was always good at like a freestyle or anything like uh -huh. that. Like he was always good at yeah. it. Always the best one in the room, like <laughs> for a fact, like easily the best one in the room. Like, but like, didn't know it yet. Like, like he would yeah. like not rap in front of anybody he like that. Like listen to all these artists like Dylan Ross and shit, and he would just make songs that were like, kind of like theirs, you know what I mean? And then eventually he just like, made songs that were like super, like then eventually he like found his own style, you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> and then like all along we've started listening to it. Like, like the older kids that Gus didn't talk to at all, like people who like probably like made fun of Gus in high school were like listening to this song. It was so funny. They're like lifeguards and that's like the so opposite of Gus. <laughs> when he came back he started just making music yeah. mad and that's yeah. when he got good, you know what I mean? Like that's when he like really like knew what he was like starting he literally know. blew up in like a year of him making like seriously making music yeah. like he put a year up, later he was like, and then like got before it before we knew it like he was having like 20,000 plays and stuff Gus knew who everyone was like that's a thing like Gus mm -hmm. knew who everyone was not only that he knew like all their like back history too like somehow uh -huh. you know what I mean like so he was like when when Jay Green hit him up he was like word like this has like serious potential you know what I mean like, mm -hmm. he knew what he was doing yeah, yeah, he knew he like knew exactly like what audience he was like making it for like he knew exactly like what he was doing at that point yeah like, if any of us tried to like give him any type of like he would be, like, be like okay. nah yeah, he would just yeah. be like shut up I'm yeah nah, he knew like, what he was doing he'd be like, like why yeah. are you making the video so low quality like let's yeah. make it good and he'd be like nah like this is the way it's supposed to be like <laughs> and now like everybody's music videos are like super low yeah. quality it's like a cool thing why are songs so short and he'd be like nah that's the way that it yeah. is yeah <laughs> like, nah, that's I mean he was fucking smart he yeah, would get he really features, I remember he would get features from all these like small artists and he would literally like ice them so hard. Like, he would literally, would be so they, bad. like the, he, their, he would, they would send him his, their verse and like they would have so many more followers and shit on SoundCloud, like so much more shit and their verse would be trash. Uh -huh. He would just like skip over their verse and just listen to Gus. <laughs> anyone like specifically but like he would just like cut like all those kids would like they're not like they wouldn't be like the friendliest person you know what I mean yeah like, yeah ever, you know and like then like all of a sudden like they were like DMing like, him and he'd be like what the fuck shit. he didn't even want to play shows in New York City because like he just like didn't want like everyone from Long Beach just like he didn't want it to be just like a Long Beach fest you know what yeah. I mean like that it would just he be, hated like, Long Beach yeah <laughs> and when he did play shows in New York like he would keep it like super DL you know what I mean like because he knew like what it could turn into, you know what I mean? The first time I um I started uh, listening to Lil Peep, um, I was uh, checking out his videos on YouTube, and I was just like, man, I was blown away. I was like, man, his style is like like Nirvana, you know? It's like like Kurt Cobain. I was I was playing Xbox, and then I checked him out, and it was fucking awesome. It's just, I think it's different, and it's like breath of fresh air. I heard like I heard like five songs, and then after he passed away, rest in peace. After he passed away, then I listened to more. But it's like that's what I was saying before. Like I really feel like he's so important, like to the generation now. Man, I was like, man, this dude is, this dude, like he gonna he gonna be huge. You know what I'm saying? 
Because at the time, when, I, when he did the song with me, he was still like underground, but his name was buzzing hard. Like he was doing packing out shows and selling out all all kind of venues and stuff like that. And um, I mean, man, when I when I heard that verse, I was like, shit, like this dude, like, he on his way up to the top. Like you know what I'm saying? Because his style was so different. Yeah, it's clear to see already, like the influence that he's had on music and the whole. I'm not gonna say a genre like music on the, on the whole music. Like rock mixed with rap, and um, you know over trap beats. So I, I just thought that was like that was uh, something new. You know what I'm saying? Something different uh, than you know we haven't seen in a while. It's, it's like a lot of dark. It's very dark. You know he has like his visuals are very dark. And then what he talks about too. You know he talks about like real life situations too as well. Like he talk about going through different things and you know and drugs and stuff like that. You know. He was pouring out real emotion on those records, you know what I'm saying? For all the kids that listen to it, they definitely understand and they relate. It's like, here's, here's me sad, and the fans, you know, they sing with you because they feel, but there's everything else behind the scenes that's just like, fuck, I, I mean, this comes with it. The money don't fix it. A lot of the times when you're coming up, you really feel like, you know, those six zeros are gonna change everything, bro. I remember, it. I used to think, man, when I make a million, that's it. Like, that must be the goal in life. Like, that must be it. But you get there and you realize, it's, you know, there's it's real pain. You know what I'm saying? There's things to sort out. You got to go and see your peoples, chill, like get your head right. It, can, it might even mean you leaving the, the, you know, the immediate people around you for a minute and finding like another safe haven that is cool to you. You know, people. Are I count on you, you know, the crew are counting on you, your, your, your manager and everybody's counting on you to get up and, you know, get out there and perform, you know, and it's a hard job, man. It's not easy. And sometimes, you know, you have to take a couple of shots of alcohol or pop or some or smoke some weed just to try to, just to try to cope. The lifestyle comes with it and it's like, that's why we love the f supporters so much. We love the fans so much because like, they really do, give us that break away from like what we're going through at that time when we're, you know, when we're performing or when they're just sending like feedback or whatever. So it's mad love because most of the time they're the ones who get it, you know what I'm saying? They're like, they're the ones you know and that can relate to your pain. Pete knew, I mean, he showed love to his fans and, and he had beautiful fans and he went out and crushed it every fucking night. It's like the, one of those one of those people come around every so often and it's just fucking in your face and I am who I am and like it or not, this is me, you know? He was at the stage where it was gonna go from him just being on the internet to him being a household name and really owning that emotion, that sound that he was putting out. Because a lot of people do that to sound like him, you know what I'm saying? But he was gonna own it. On the household name. That dude was talented, man. I mean, you you can, you can you can you can see it. You can hear it. I mean, like, just think where you know who knows where that shit would have went. You know, like, I think it would have went all the way up to the Grammys and beyond. We'll never have another one. But you know, we got we got stuff to remember and listen to. You know, and some memory of them. I don't know. It's um. I just figured, you know what? I got. I got all my boys on me, you know, people that I musically look up to, but, um, you know, I just figured to pay respect and, because I think that he belongs with all these guys, you know, like he's, you know, his music does the same to me that their music does, you know. He passed away, rest in peace with the vision, man, and he's going to live forever. I'm saying Pete's vision is forever, man. I met Pete. Um, online, actually, like, I found him online, like, I heard his music, and I liked it, like, you know, it sounded different from everything, so, like, I think I, I think I hit him up, or, like, one of his friends or something, and I was like, oh, uh, let me send you a beat, and, you know, we, we, we hung out for a while, like, up until we went on tour, and we went on tour together with Fat Nick, and pretty much, like, me and people are the opener, so he was, like, my roommate for, like, two months, pretty much. So we were like, those two months, we were like bestest friends. He was exactly like, you know, what I expected him to be. He was a cool dude, like, 
really happy. You know what I'm saying? He was really friendly. He was never looking for problems with nobody. Like, he was just like, he was, a, and he was a good friend to have. You know what I'm saying? He was a good friend. That was my, one of my close friends. I had heard of him um, before uh, when I was living in Virginia. Uh, I was going through like hella legal shit and I was getting locked up. And he had this one bar in one of his songs. He was like, free young boy, little Tracy ho. And I was like, who is this? I met up with him for the first time at his house in Pasadena in California. And we barely even spoke two words, but we we made a song and it was White Tea. And then we made the video like the hour after that. It was all hella natural. Everything we did was easy. It was like, it was like drinking water. We would just always be together, like going around Cali, like doing the random ass shows. There was a point, it was a couple of months where we were like pretty much like glued together. He was my best friend. I could tell him whatever. And we made a lot of music together. Nothing that we said in those songs wasn't true. Like, it was just, yeah, it was just real feelings. And he really put all his emotion in his music. Like, it was really his passion. Like, he really loved it. Like, you could still go, you could listen to, you could listen to any Peep song you want. And it's like, if you really know him, you're like, damn, there's nothing fake about it. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't an act, you know, it was, it was really what he was living, going through, you know what I'm saying, like battling depression. Like, he was like, I remember when I went on tour, like, some days he would, he would be really down, some days he would be straight. Probably do, we definitely deal with more anxiety than the regular person. Because people expect so much from you when you're, you know, they just think that he was just on drugs, like living his life with no pressure, just a rock rock star, like nah. And the bigger it gets is like, the more pressure on your shoulders, the more people depending on you. And you know, that's a lot to deal with, especially like, especially when you're already like having trouble like dealing with yourself. There was a time, there was a time where like he was so fucked up. Me and Krez like would stay, stayed up to watch him. He told like he, it's cause he would, he would talk to us about his problems and like, you know, he would let like his problems like eat him alive and stuff. And like, I guess that was his like way out. I'm just glad that um, we got to do what we did in the amount of time that we did it. I know everyone feels hella lonely now because everyone feels like they lost their best friend. I thought it was, I thought it was, wasn't real. You know, like seeing that shit on Twitter, I was like, nah. I hadn't even talked to him probably in like over a month. We knew it was kind of like weird. I was tired of being like, you know, the little homie on the verse. Like, no, bro, he was, ugh. I hate, I be thinking about it. I tried to, uh, at that, towards like the end, when they were on that tour, they were in Philly and I was just like, yo, can I pull up? And they were like, nah. <laughs> but I wasn't tripping. I think if I would've seen him, I'm not saying that I, like, oh, I'm like, I could've been like a hero, right? but, I think things maybe would have been, been different. We probably would have really took over like the whole world, I feel like, eventually. Because I knew we would have ended up being friends again. I forget where I was at, but these kids came up to me and they was like, bro, do you understand how like legendary the songs that you made with him on? He's pretty much a, he's a legend. Like, he's literally a legend, like I said. Like, because everybody's a rock star nowadays, you know what I'm saying? But he was, a like, 
use this generation as like a rock star. Th this will be the music that in 30 years, like kids will be like, as adults, you know, playing for their kids. And I think that is awesome. My first impression of Little Peep. My first impression of Little Peep, my first ever impression was I had seen um, one of my youngers that um, I rep with has showed me a picture of Little Peep um, on a social and said, look, this boy looks like you. That's the first impression. I was like, who's this kid? And then from then, I started watching him. Like, not necessarily his music, but just watching his lifestyle. To be honest with you, the next step from there was this little shit. Better come and, like, better come and talk to us and say what's good. Because what's really happening here? But then, like, that little shit came to my house. By, like, came to my house and stood with me and said, told me everything. that I, I, Stuff I don't even want to say, but it, that how I had inspired him. And that he, he looked like how he did because of how I looked. I c I've never in my whole entire life, I've been here for 30 years on this earth, I've never, ever, ever had such a close bond with someone so quickly, like a real brotherly love from when we first met. It was like we would say, this is like looking in a mirror. He came to London and he felt like it was home. He was about to move there. Literally, he was coming off tour to come home and live in London. When I tell you everyone in my city, even the big hood man, not everyone, but like all the people I'm around, hood guys love little people. British people are quite cynical. It's quite like a, yeah, we're cynics. And he managed to change some of my, like, people in my life who are older than me, who are some of the most cynical people on this earth, who don't, he changed their whole outlook. A 21-year-old boy from a completely different country changed my friend's outlook on life. This was him. You know them on? Open energy to everything, just open. We talked about like the shit we've been through. I talked about him about his like, we talked about the pain and like, I don't want to like say, but like about love, about girls we're in love with, shit that was happening, like people that were doing stuff to us. He consoled me like an older brother. So I held that role and I spoke to him like I should as an older brother, because I do have a little brother. And I was just like, yo, look, if this person is fucking your shit up and is wasting your energy and getting to you, cut them out. If this person's getting to you, cut them out. Like, you don't need that. You give too much. That boy gave so much more than he took. He did not take. He does not know how to take. All he knew how to do was give. Like, he, he gave me his chain. First, thing he ever, first time he ever came to my house, he gave me that chain. You know that upside down cross, the pink one? Like, his first chain, I gave, it, I gave that to my little brother. So it's like everything's in the family. Like, he, well, he passed away with the 616 axe on his neck, a chain I'd given him. Like he passed away with it on his neck, which is a deep thing for me, like that shit hurt. The last conversation I had with him, I said, I love you, be careful out there. Just, you know what happened to my little brother out there. That was it, because I knew he was in Tucson. And I nearly lost my little brother in Tucson before. And then Gus died, just like that. It was, cr my house was, bro, I smashed the whole room. Like I lost a little brother and a best friend. Like at the same time, which is real difficult. If you're such a powerful soul like Pete, if you if you play with the darkness and if you mess with that and you manifest those things, they w it can come for you. Same way the light comes. You have to be very careful what you wish for. And he was just a young boy. He just like he was just a young boy. It just is what it is, and I'm just grateful that I got to that I got to just sh be even around the boy. Standing next to him was my, that's on my proudest moment, standing next to him. I keep all the shit he drew on my walls. Like I, am, I got my house redecorated, but I can left the shit he drew on my walls just out of that. I just want to see it. That to me, my brother, like, I love him. I love, like, love proper. All I have to do now is, like, live up to, like, keep his legacy, like, keep his legacy alive. People will know Peep. People are going to know Peep. The world will know Peep. He doesn't need to have kids. He had a f million kids. They're all out there. You can go listen to them. You can go watch his kids. Like, it's his song, his music. That's his children. Like, that's, how, like, that's, what he, that's his legacy. Yeah, like, Peep's not dead. Like, yeah, okay, yeah. 
But Peter's not dead. Peter's forever. Peter's immortal. He is infinite. He is forever. Bro, he's pink, isn't it? Pink for Pete, that's not a joke. It's pink for Pete forever, bro. Literally pink for Pete for the rest of my life, fam. Some of the first I ever heard of Gus was um, through mutual friends. I, you know, I started seeing videos of this kid, Lil Peep, playing these shows um, where everyone knew, already knew all the words and everything. And I was like, you know, checked it out, realized, you know, him and I kind of knew sort of similar people. Um, and I, once I listened to the music, I was like, okay, wow, this is really special and cool. And I was a fan really right away. I think I was able to recognize Peep's songwriting capabilities like really early on. Like I, you know, I write lyrics and I, I produce, I write all my own music, you know, and I know how hard it is to really write a good hook that's really catchy or to write like a really strong vocal melody, you know, it's not that easy. But for Peep, it seemed totally effortless. Um, these super catchy melodies that he would just come up with off the fly, it seemed like every song was so catchy, every song, uh, you know, just all these hooks that I thought were really genius. I think that that influence is the, the sort of trap influence, you know, like, uh, songs that are just only hooks, you know, people, like, that's been happening in rap for a while now, I think, where it, you, just this mantra kind of you repeat over and over again. Um, but I think someone like Peep was taking that and making it even more melodic and more like a chorus that's just kind of over and over again. Part of his genius was that he was just this really gifted uh, musician in that way. His sense of melody was incredible. The things that Peep was blending together, which is obviously rap, culture, but also just this more like free expression, um, underground electronic kind of vibe, which it brings things from all different histories, you know. Sure, there's emo, but it's also like, you know, electronica or, you know, 90s shoegaze and grunge and like, uh, and then fuse, fusing all these things with like a rap bravado and like, uh, you know, those sensibilities of like hip hop culture, um, but blending it all in with these weird kind of underground experimental aesthetics, um, which isn't easy to do. Like trying to explain it is one thing, but like not everyone can really do that. Someone like Peep could where you're you're taking from all these different subcultures at, at the same time and creating something totally new out of that. Like, Peep was a real master engineer that way, uh, like making, he knew what he wanted to sound like. And I think to judge him in like a strictly rap context or like a emo context, like you're totally missing the full spectrum of what's going on. It's so crazy for how young Peep was and how advanced he was in that way of like this fully realized sonic palette. His vocal styles and the lyrical content, I think, was what really set him apart. Um, you know, it was so dark and brooding and serious and, like, emotional. I kept thinking of just, like, what it would be like for me to be a teenager and be hearing this for the first time. Um, it's like you feel a part of yourself in that music when it's happening. I don't know, I just wish he was still around because his influence is so vast and there are a lot of people that are just sort of taking this blueprint that he, he set and just kind of like just doing that exactly. Whereas Peep was so special because he was purely himself, you know, his spirit was just shining and it was authentic because of that. He was really his own artist. He knew what was right. He knew what he felt inside, you know, um, and was just being true to himself, I think. So we was in London in the Airbnb. It was like four in the morning and I'd work at six. I was about to get an Uber back home from London to here to like get changed. I was a bin man at the time, so I was about to get my uniform on and go, uh, go out cleaning the streets and shit. 
I started saying bye to everyone and people was like, where are you going? And like, it's late, like, we, like you can stay here. I was like, oh, I've got work. He was like, oh, fuck, man. He was like, um, literally just said, he was like, you don't have to work no more if you want. Like, we can, we'll find something for you to do. So what do you mean? In my head, I'm thinking bills, paying my mum's rent, like all this shit. I'm like, what do you mean I'm gonna have to work? Like, he looked me in the eyes, he was like, I got you. Like, he was like, bro, your brain, like, why are you, you don't need to be emptying bins. Like, he was like, you're, you, you're like special. Like, you, you know what I mean? You need to be using your skills. Otherwise, like, you don't need to be a bin man anymore. He asked me how much I was earning at, at the week. And he was like, all oh, right, times that by four. He's like, so you only, like, how much, how much I needed to pay my mum, innit? Because I was paying my mum like rent and shit, so he worked out how much I needed to pay. He was like, all right, we can do this, this, this in a month, and then you can pay a month from that. I was like, I was like what the fuck? I, was like, I went in the bathroom, had a little think. I think I went like, fuck! Because <laughs> I was like, so torn. I was like, do I quit my job or do I just go back and like do it for a bit longer? And I just come out, I was like, oh, fuck it, like, I'm staying here. And everyone was like, yeah! <laughs> I rang him in the morning, and I was like, I ain't coming in no more. Like, I ain't coming in no more. I'm a superstar. No, I'm joking. But I said, it was like, oh, it was like, you, all right then, no worries, you're gonna be in Friday then? I was like, no, nah, like, I'm not coming in no more, like, I'm done. And uh, yeah, and I never, I haven't been back to work since. Literally, three days later, Fashion Week, he was like, boom, you're my, you're my cameraman. So he's on Fashion Week, Milan, Paris. Then he was like, tour next month. And then that was it, like, yeah. And I was there till the end, man. And I'm not, like, it was weird for me as well, because I've never, like, no one's ever helped me with anything, you know what I mean? I've always, like, I got, went out and got a job when I was, like, 15 and shit. I always wanted my own money. I, I never relied on anyone. So then you got this kid here the same age as me, like, and he's just fucking, and, like, not relying on him, but he's just offered, like, he just changed my life, bro. And he did. It's crazy. Yeah, no, I remember that night forever, man. He was ahead of, like, People start picking up on this shit and then he'd switch himself up, change everything. That's what you meant to do as an artist, isn't it? Get shit, destroy it, and rebuild it. You know what? Somebody had actually mentioned it him to me. That there, somebody told me there was this young guy like that was down, like living in Skid Row, that was that was starting this this new movement. So I just kinda heard about it. First impression of people is like, you know, he came up, he was, he was like, he's very tall. And he's, he's, and despite like massive amounts of tattoos and kind of crazy hair, he's a super handsome guy. And, and it was interesting because we were at a restaurant and I think like half the ladies in the restaurant couldn't take their eyes off him. They just kept looking at him and like, you know, we, and he was kind of like, yeah, he was like <laughs> waving at him and everything, you know. <laughs> and he actually starts out, he's kind of shy. And then, um, then all of a sudden, he's leading the conversation. I mean, he knows what he wants. His vibe and his knowledge about what was going on was so deep and so thick. Like, he was an easy guy to, to like, look up to as an artist. I was like, this guy's amazing. He has so much stuff going on. Yeah, his hair and his style, I mean, he had that third eye kind of thing where he knew exactly how he should look and where he should be. I mean, it's actually a very hard thing to walk into like a, you know, a Hollywood restaurant where we were and to actually truly command the, the attention of 80% of the people in that, in that restaurant just because of the way you look. Like just people on the street for no reason. Like they would just be like, who's that? Like just, he's a head turner. Um, Little People was a guy who was fascinating to me because he was basically doing the same thing. If he was taking Green Day and My Chemical Romance and his favorite trap and hip hop music and marrying those styles to create something new, you've got to kind of be a genius to be able to do that kind of stuff and make it work, and he, he was. The poetry that's on top of there, um, even from the, right from the beginning, he never sings the word of bullshit. It's always like, it's coming right at you. And, um, and the fact that um, his phrasing, like he doesn't phrase, like a lot of people in pop music or whatever, there's a lot of ways that you can, you know, you can make a little four bar phrase, a little four bar melody, and then do another four bar melody and then do a C section or whatever. He's kind of like, he's more sophisticated than that. Peep was, was actually a fan of a lot of records that I had done 
earlier in my career. He was he really loved um, um, you know like Green Day's Time of Your Life, a lot of Green Day music, and a lot of My Chemical Romance music, um, and some Jawbreaker stuff off of Dear Dear You. It's called. Um, and I think that, you know, he liked some strings I had done and some guitars, but I think he let me know, he was like, I like all that stuff, I don't really want to do that, but I, what I want to do is take a part of that and mix it with trap and hip hop. I want to go emo trap hip hop mix, which was amazing to me. I was like, fuck yeah, let's do it. <laughs> let's see what happens. He was like, play the piano for me. And I was like, okay. And so I started playing all kinds of stuff and, um, and he was, he was really quick. He was like, oh, I like that one. Or, no, I don't play like that. Or play this one, you know. And I would always, and then I realized what he really liked was, was, was like dark music, like dark chords and dark feeling, like ominous feeling things. I was thinking of it dark from like, almost like old metal or something, you know. And then I thought, then internally I was like, oh, I know, I'm going to just, it just came to you, I'm going to move the bass around. And I was doing that because I was think thinking, <laughs> it's crazy dopey stuff, but I was thinking like, oh, there's a bell on one side of town and then there's this bell on the other side of town and it's scary and there's like vampires and I'm going, vampire one, and then another bell from another place, and then another over there from that part of town and I'm like, we're all surrounded by vampires. And they were different bells. And then, uh, when I got back to the one, and I was going, and then I, and then I did it one more time, then I looked up and, and the spokes going, yeah! <laughs> my impression was, as I go, oh my God, this guy's a superstar. He's on to something, and this is just the very beginning. When you're breaking down those, those new musical boundaries, and you're putting it in a different form, there's usually, at the beginning, a negativity towards it. Because it, it does sound foreign, and it does challenge you to think of something new. And you probably won't like it right at first. But sometimes that's the most satisfying music, because after a few listens, and all of a sudden you get this light go, go, going, and then all of a sudden it, it bursts through, and then there's so much feeling in it, and then you realize you're listening to something that's absolutely genius. That he had that. I am so sad that he uh, is not here. No long, he's no longer with us because, first of all, it's it's so rare to meet somebody like that and to have a partnership with somebody who's so good. And so I was truly looking forward to getting in again. And I knew that the world lost somebody that day because, again, like he was he was gifted with this amazing talent, and that we just weren't gonna get to see it go for the next twenty years. He was. He was weaving his legend. It was just the beginning things of, of, he was starting to weave his world. My name is Adam McElwee. My stage name is Wicker Face, Springs Eternal. Uh, I was in Goth Boy Click with Gus and uh, yeah, started Goth Boy Click with Cold Heart. Man, October of 2000, 2016, I think, um, when I actually first met him. And he had moved, Gus had moved out to LA at that time. Uh, so he was friends with Chris Horsehead, friends with Ned Arb, uh, friends with Jay. And I think it was Chris who was really pushing for him to join Goth Boy Click. So I told them to have him call me. And I talked to him for five minutes. And I realized that he was significantly nicer than most people that I encounter in this scene, in, in this world, really like sweet. And he, I mean, from the start, he, he was probably bigger than all of us at that point, more popular than all of us. And then a week later, Goth Boy Click had a show in LA, and I think it was just billed as Goth Boy Click, kind of vague as to who was going to be there. Uh, and he was there, he came to that show. I think honestly, Absolute and Doubt, I think came together in that week, the week between me having the initial phone call with Gus and that show. Um, it was quick. He sent me the beat and he just said, you know, take as much time as, like, do whatever you want on it. 
And um, so I did like the first half, he did the second half. But when Gus sent his part back, I was like, I mean, this is, this is a legitimate song. This isn't, I feel like what happens a lot of time with this genre, and it might be the case in rap in general, is uh, you send someone a beat or you send someone an open, um, you do your thing, they do their thing. But, I mean, Gus bridged our two parts, like, perfectly in a way that you kind of have to be a legitimate songwriter to do that. And that's what I realized. He's not, this isn't just someone who does a verse on a song and is out, you know, and, and doesn't do it. He'll work to make the song cohesive and to make it a, a collaborative effort. Very lucky, I'm very lucky to, to be one of the people who got to perform a song with him regularly, even if it was for, I think we did 13 shows together, maybe. I didn't expect to do Absolute and Doubt live ever, just because he had so many hits and I just, I don't know, I didn't think that that was one of them necessarily. So yeah, I don't know. He definitely, I mean, he would be singing my parts. He would back me up knowing exactly where I needed a breath in the songs. And I would do the same for him, but, you know, the fact that he knew to do that was just awesome. I, you know, What I found most admirable about him was his personal life and, like, his, uh, just his demeanor towards me and I think mean, everyone that was around him, what I say every time I talk about him was just how sweet he was. I remember him getting like a bunch of beats, like big like 808 Mafia beats and like Sunny Digital beats, and then just sending them to us and being like, who wants to get on these beats? Like who, you know? And it's like, no, these are yours. Like you worked for this. He's never selfish. That's the, he was never selfish. As an artist, like, he was born to just be this more than human star. And I mean, there was no other option. He succeeded. He definitely succeeded at, at transcending just like the normal day-to-day -day life bullshit and, uh, you know, and being the artist that he wanted to be creating. Um, and that goes from writing songs and recording to live performance to the way he dressed and like the way he would style his hair and stuff like that. You know, he just, he had it all perfect. He did commit to what Lil Peep was, but at the same time, it was him. Like that was him. He was Lil Peep. It was just like a different aspect of him. My name is Zane Lowe, out in Los Angeles, California. There were two who were very vocal and were really trying to get my attention, just purely on like a you'll love this kind of thing. And one was Travis Mills and the other was Daniel P. Carter. Um, and, and I remember Dan came around to my house and sort of wouldn't leave until he'd played Little Peep. You need to really listen to this now. You can't just kind of skirt over it or dance around it. You've got to really listen to it. So he put it on really loud. What I recognized when I started really listening to Peep's music was that it was entirely believable on every level. And when that happens, you don't really think about like, oh, it reminds me of this or it reminds me of that or it sounds a bit like this or there's a combination of elements to make something new. You're just drawn into the, just a very real experience. You know, I, I interviewed him once on FaceTime and um, recognized that he was very honest and very connected to his music and wanted to help others with his music. Recognized that in him pretty much immediately. It's a powerful body of work for such a young artist at the early stage of their career and who, who knows where that conversation would have gone. I'm really interested in what this guy's saying with his music. Um, I do understand that the influences are coming in from different places and I think that that's going to you know, leave, leave a real mark. And I could tell from talking to people that he was starting to become one of those artists that was reaching people in a very deep and real way. It wasn't just like, that sounds cool, that looks cool. You know?
that person's cool. It was like, no, 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 this is people are connecting this into a, in a different way. And you can feel that. You know when an artist has got some authenticity to them that just reaches people and then it goes beyond that, all that surface stuff. Surface stuff is important, it's cool. It's what drives a lot of decisions and a lot of stuff that's going on all the time. We're always like, wow, that looks really cool, or I wanna go there, that looks great, or you know what I mean? But it, when it gets deeper than that, that's for real stuff and it's rare. So absolutely, I'd love to you know, catch up with this young man and find out what's moving him and motivating him. Which is crazy because he was a great pop writer. He had great pop melodies. I mean, he had catchy hooks. You know, I, I, I think that if he'd carried on, that just would have come more and more naturally to him. I never felt like he was struggling to find a way to, to connect with me or with an audience. Like, you know, he had a really natural way with his music and way with his words. And, you know, some of it was really hard to listen to because it's so honest and personal and dark at times and deep and just transparent. But the melodies were very, you know, you could connect to them. I think he's an influence. I think his music will continue to influence. Um, I really, really wanted to be his music and who he was and what he said rather than the manner into which he left. Like, I, I just, that's just tragedy. We can't really glorify that stuff, you know what I mean? It's really got to be about the music that was left behind and, and what he was saying at that time. And again, I could be wrong, but I just would like to think that as he'd continued to go, he'd have got to a place where some clarity, some wisdom, some life, some experience reinforced his message and allowed him to be of even more value and support for people. Because I do feel that he was trying to do that. I do feel that his music, like I said, wasn't some kind of narcissistic, self-indulgent experience, that he was sort of saying these things because it was like helping him and he was like, it might help others too. It's a really, tr really tragic situation and an amazing, promising artist who I think was gonna go on and say some really powerful things. Um, is no longer around. You just don't know where they would have gone and that's part of the sadness of it but also if you can keep an open mind and it kind of makes you feel better too thinking that there were so many different ways and paths that a little peep could have gone down. Like I said in five, ten years time, who knows man.